Welcome to Library Seminars, No Essential Libraries webinar series for the presentation of research and ideas that reflect and support the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's mission. Our presentation today asks the question, is ignoring predation mortality leading to an inability to achieve management goals in Alaska? The presentation is part of the National Stock Assessment Science Seminar Series, which is developed by NOAA Fisheries. Today's speaker, Grant Adams, will be introduced by the organizer and host of the series, Kristen Blackheart, from the Office of Science and Technology. Before I hand over the mic, here are just a few housekeeping items for our live audience members to improve the webinar experience. If at any point you're having trouble with audio or visual components of GoToWebinar, please just log out and rejoin us. This will reset the software and usually resolves most technical issues. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel later today. I'll add the channel's link to the chat box. Our speaker has shared his slides with us, so please feel free to download them from the handouts menu and the webinar control panel. And most important, we're very interested in your questions, and we encourage you to ask them throughout the seminar, even though the speaker will not address them until the end of his presentation. All audience members are muted, so type your questions or comments in the chat box under questions, located in the webinar control panel. So that's it from me. I'm going to hand the mic over to Kristen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. I am pleased to introduce Grant Adams. Um, Grant got his start um, studying biology at Denison University and then served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Peru before going on to earn a master's degree in coastal sciences at the University of Southern Mississippi Gulf Coast Research Lab. Um, after that, he came up to Washington and is currently a uh, PhD student at the um, University of Washington School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences. Um, we are going to be treated today to some very fresh research results that Grant has been working on related to MSE um, for the Gulf of Alaska um, groundfish fishery. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Grant and give him the rest of the time. Thank you very much, Grant, for being here today. Perfect. Thanks for having me. Um, and hello, everyone. I'm going to talk to you all about some of my PhD work that uh, is aiming to get at this question of whether or not um, ignoring predation mortality um, kind of inhibits our ability to achieve management goals in Alaska. And um, um, this work has been supported by a few organizations and I've had some great collaborators helping me out along the way with um, um, the with my research and wanted to acknowledge them before I get into it. And perfect. Um, so kind of just um, walk through kind of what I see contemporary fisheries management is we go out and we're interested in a fishery either for kind of economic or, or conservation re reasons. And we go out on some regular time step to collect data. We send out surveys to uh, get an idea of how the population is trending through time. Uh, we do uh, kind of dedicated surveys or, or uh, along with those surveys collect biological information on uh, to understand the dynamics of the species that we're interested in. So like the survival, growth, maturity. And we monitor the fisheries that uh, catch these species that we're interested in to get an idea of the scale of the population. And all that information is fed to someone uh, like me uh, for some sort of population dynamics modeling. And, and largely in uh, uh, fisheries assessment, this is some sort of single species population dynamics model where we estimate target and limit reference points and, and from that get an idea of the stock status or the status of the population relative to those targets and limits and uh, some recommendation for a uh, for a sustainable catch. And from that modeling, we can then feed that to uh, managers who will then limit the catch somehow using either effort, uh, gear, or spatial temporal uh, limitations. But most of these models are single species, and so they 
assume that the dynamics are, are really between uh, a single fish stock and, and the fishery. But in reality, we know that these systems are complex and multi-species and that uh, kind of trophic interactions between species can affect the dynamics of one another. And there can be some consequences from using these single species models. We can have biased uh, reference points that we use for management. Um, so leading to a biased perception of, of maximum sustainable yield or, or stock status. Um, uh, single species models can have uh, poor predictive performance because they may overfit data. And ultimately this can lead to uh, kind of suboptimal decision making over or under harvesting the, the population that we're interested in. And this is kind of where multi-species and I come into play. Uh, uh, in this case, I'll be talking mostly about multi-species that estimate time-varying predation mortality. And from these, we can output time series of mortality to input into assessments like um, some folks here in, in Alaska do or, or uh, some of the ICES assessments do. We can try to get at what's driving population fluctuations, uh, comparing predation versus environmental drivers. Um, we can use these models to kind of guide strategic decision-making, trade-offs between harvesting different species, uh, projecting uh, fishery and climate and trophic interactions. Um, and we can use these as management or operating models and uh, management strategy evaluations and kind of in the future, uh, use these for tactical management decisions, getting multi-species harvest strategies or, or multi-species biological reference points. Um, and in some cases, they're currently used as uh, ecological reference points, which uh, is essentially a, a limit based off of, of uh, uh, trophic interactions. And just a brief bit of terminology, there's a few of these kind of multi-species uh, models that I'll be kind of mentioning, uh, MSVPA, multi-species virtual population analysis, MSCAA, multi-species statistical catch at age, uh, Seattle, which I'll go into later, SMS and Gadget. And all these models are, are very similar in their underlying uh, population dynamics and kind of go off this uh, Anderson and Urson, um, um, uh, MSVPA sort of uh, uh, predation mortality component, and they're all uh, models of intermediate complexity, as I would describe them. But not all models of intermediate or intermediate complexity are are the above. So a little bit of overview. I'm going to go into um, development of the Seattle model for um, the Gulf of Alaska and and kind of where we've taken it and. Uh, a little bit about some of uh, uh, management strategy evaluation I've done. So uh, for Alaskan ground fish, I'm going to be focusing on the Gulf of Alaska and Eastern Bering Sea. And we're mainly interested in Pacific Cod, Halibut, Walleye Pollock, and Arrowtooth Flounder, which are all um, economically important for the region. They're highly connected trophically. and uh, these other species, at least in the Gulf of Alaska, represent the majority of total mortality, including fish or with fishing for pollock. And so on the figure on the right, we see uh, some estimates of mortality sources for walleye pollock in the Gulf of Alaska, with most coming from halibut, uh, arrowtooth, and cod. And so given these um, trophic interactions, there's uh, a high interest in accounting for these predation dynamics in management. And this has led to the development of the Seattle model, which was developed by uh, Kirsten Holzman uh, and published in 2016. Um, and was developed in ADMB for the Eastern Bering Sea ground fish, pollock, cod, and arrowtooth flounder. It includes kind of linkages with environmental factors for recruitment, consumption, and growth. And essentially, it's a multi species statistical catch at age model. 
or which has this MSVPA-based predation mortality component. Um, and it's useful because we're mostly interested in predation mortalities, and so this model is appropriate for that. Uh, and it's currently used as a supplement for single species uh, assessments. So essentially, it's an age-structured model where the numbers of uh, one species at the next age in the next year is a function of the numbers of that species uh, this age, this year, uh, times a mortality component, uh, Z. And that Z mortality component is decomposed into a residual mortality, M1, representing uh, sources of mortality that are not uh, 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 that are not from the predators in the model, so uh, disease, senescence, uh, predation from other species outside the model. This M2 component, so predation from the species that we include this uh, in the model, and uh, and fishing mortality. And I'll uh, talk a little bit about M1 and M2 a little bit down the line. Um, so again, mortality is decomposed into this residual uh, and predation mortality component. And essentially this predation mortality is, is related to the ratio between the prey we estimate to be consumed of a species at age relative to uh, the uh, prey, um, that species at age, uh, the biomass available. And uh, it's somewhat uh, equal to the diet times the uh, predator biomass times the predator uh, uh, ration. And I can, uh, if you're interested in the specific theory, I would rep re recommend reading, um, there's a Magnuson uh, 1995 goes into all the uh, kind of equations quite well. But um, one of the big things we need to drive these models is diet information. So the proportion of a prey at age by weight in the stomach of a predator at age relative to all other prey uh, uh, ages. So this model was first developed for the Bering Sea and then we, uh, we're interested in expanding it to the Gulf of Alaska. So I'm gonna talk about some of the work we did doing that and developing a R package for, for uh, the Seattle model. And first I'm gonna go into bridging uh, Seattle to uh, TMB uh, and then trying to uh, uh, expand it for, to approximate the current assessments used for the Gulf of Alaska and then incorporating Pacific halibut and a little bit about uh, the diet and estimation and some examples of, of output. And all this work was recently published in uh, Fisheries Research, if you're interested. Um, and the uh, code is publicly available on, on GitHub. So for model bridging, Again, the model was developed in ADMB, and we were interested in porting it over to template model builder so we could um, estimate some things as random effects. And and um, and at least for me, uh, doing a PhD, I was interested in building the model I was working with for my degree, and uh, this provided a great opportunity to really learn the model well and and um, and uh, build it up from scratch. And some of the major changes that we uh, added to it was uh, we took it from a either a sex combined or a one sex model to a two sex model where you can either uh, specify if it's uh, you know females only uh, combined or uh, or uh, or or two sexes. Um, we added functionality to fit multiple surveys, fisheries flexibly. Um, and you can specify whatever kind of selectivity catchability function you want uh, pretty easily. Um, added some bias corrections and. Uh, some other predator functions or predation functions that you can estimate or 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 fix at some sort of assumed value, and um, uh, also included some other kind of standard assessment stuff like aging error and um, um, and um, uh, add some other functions which I'll which I'll talk about down the line. 
and um, we're currently using it right now to to fit three different multi-species models and um, uh, which is super exciting. Uh, it's fun to see all the code work that you do uh, get used for something. Um, so yeah, we ported it over to TMB and now we're interested in, in, in approximating the current assessments in the Gulf of Alaska. And so uh, it's age and sex structured. Uh, we do this MSVPA predation and we're interested in uh, walleye pollock, Pacific cod, Aratooth flounder and Pacific halibut. And we're going to use the same data as the uh, current assessments. And, and uh, we spent a lot of effort trying to uh, parameterize the model and add, add flexibility to really match the assessments. And uh, overall, I think we did quite well in the uh, kind of here are time series of biomass for each of the three species. Um, apart from Pacific halibut, and I'll go into that in a second, where um, we fit the uh, Seattle model to data from the assessments and compare it to the assessment output. And uh, here the assessment is dark purple and three different Seattle models with different starting times are in uh, the yellow, uh, green, and blue. And as you can see, they're, they're matching quite well and uh, at least for the Pollock assessment, it's uh, parameterized exactly the same as the Pollock assessment and Aratooth flounder and cod are very similar with some minor differences. Um, we don't have uh, conditional age at length in there and so uh, had to do uh, um, kind of standard multinomial age count for cod. Um, yeah, so ported it over and now, um, one of the big questions was, um, how do we incorporate uh, Pacific halibut? And there were kind of three challenges for this. And the first one being uh, differences in distribution. Halibut range from California to the Bering Sea, um, while the cod, pollock, and flounder stocks that we're interested in are um, assumed to be GOA specific. Um, and there's also differences in data, the years, uh, with overlap um, uh, between the different uh, stocks that we have uh, data for. And uh, particularly for halibut, there's, it's currently managed using an ensemble of four different assessments. There's kind of two long time series models and two short time series models that uh, kind of uh, model the spatial uh, components of the fishery a little bit different, uh, areas as fleet model and a kind of coast-wide uh, model and so we want to incorporate some uncertainty there and uh, um, but we also only have information on the distribution of halibut in the Gulf of Alaska from 1993 onwards even though uh, some of these stocks we have information on from uh, from very early or the 1970s um, so we ended up combining um, kind of two modeling approaches, this multi-species statistical catch at edge Seattle model with a extended single species uh, modeling approach where we allowed flexibility to input a either relative or absolute numbers at age into the uh, Seattle model and multiply it by the uh, uh, proportion of the uh, stock that's in the Gulf of Alaska. So we take the numbers at age from the halibut assessment multiplied by the percent of the stock in the Gulf of Alaska, which is here at the bottom, and directly input it into Seattle. Uh, we also explored using an index of relative abundance from the survey, um, where we multiplied it by a scaling coefficient Q and uh, where that is estimable. And, um, uh, and then explored some sensitivities about the distribution and abundance of, of halibut, kind of following their ensemble approach where uh, we have four different models, Seattle models for each of their four different assessment models. And then given differences in um, 
uh, time series length and the amount of data that we have uh, on the distribution of, uh, of halibut in the Gulf of Alaska made some assumptions about the relative uh, proportion of the stock in the uh, Gulf of Alaska prior to 1993. I'll talk about that a little bit more down the line. So we got our standard assessment data set up. We got um, halibut set up by just inputting the numbers at age. And kind of how the we set up the package is that you take an Excel document and uh, input your standard assessment data, the index composition data, uh, empirical weighted age, their aging error matrices, uh, kind of the uh, maturity sex ratio, and your mortality, which can also be uh, estimated, uh, and input that into Excel document as well with predation data. And so this is the uh, data you won't tend to see if you're running a stock synthesis model, and this includes uh, bioenergetics data, how much are, uh, uh, is a fish at age eating in terms of weight, diet data, what are they eating, and temperature. And so this temperature component will, will relate to the bioenergetic consumption. And uh, it was really great having Kirsten already do all the bioenergetics modeling so I could uh, um, use the estimates uh, from her work directly into the GOA Seattle model. And the diet data we took from the uh, uh, Alaska Center's summer bottom trawl survey, and um, uh, which is a length and area stratified survey. And um, some good references on this is Barnes et al. and Livingston et al. And from this diet data, we needed to get an estimate of the proportion of prey at age by weight and a predator at age. And we uh, used a mixed approach that accounted for the sampling design of the survey. Uh, uh, and if you're interested in that, you can look at our recently published paper. Uh, perfect. So we have all the data. And some of the decimal parameters of the model are the annual recruitment, initial age structure, uh, fishing mortality, catchability, and selectivity. And all these are estimated whether or not we uh, run it in multi-species mode, where M2 uh, is greater than zero, or single species mode, where we turn off predation. And we fit it to composition data, uh, survey data, and catch data. So I'm now going to talk about some kind of example fits to uh, example model outputs. Um, so a little bit about the fitting steps. We first fit the single species models. Um, and I showed those before, comparing them to the assessment models or the assessment, yeah, the assessment models. We reweight the composition data using uh, 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 McAllister Ian Ellie weights. And then either we take those single species models where uh, and treat and reestimate them, treating the uh, recruitment as random effects, or we then phase in predation mortality and estimate them in multi species mode. And uh, uh, once we get the multi species models up, we then estimate uh, um, the recruitment in the multi species models as random effects. And, we kind of have to do this phasing approach because estimating the multi-species models from, from scratch, we uh, have a tar hard time getting it to uh, converge. And so we got to phase it in. And, and same thing with the uh, uh, recruitment as random effects. These are, uh, they take a little bit of time to converge. And the closer we can get there before, before we start optimization, the, the better. So. Perfect. We have, uh, so for the Gulf Alaska model, we, we explored a few sensitivities where we had uh, models without predation mortality. So essentially those single species models, uh, no halibut in the model, some assumptions about the halibut distribution prior to 1993, uh, the time series length. So using those 
uh, halibut short and long time series models. And using that absolute uh, numbers at age from the halibut assessment versus the relative numbers at age from uh, their long line survey. So we ended up with uh, 16 different models. And here's the time series of spawning stock biomass for each of those models where Pollock's at the top, Aerotooth flounder, cod, and halibut. And the main thing I want to get out of this is that uh, the time series length where uh, seems to be, uh, or the, the outputs of the model seems rel are relatively insensitive to the time series length, uh, but they are sensitive to whether or not we include predation mortality. So in this Pollock model, the clump of lines at the top are the multi-species models, while the clump of lines at the bottom are the single species model, which is uh, kind of what you'd expect. They uh, uh, have different assumptions regarding mortality and so have different population scaling. And same sort of thing with arrowtooth flounder and slightly with cod, uh, but these uh, species, at least in this model, have less uh, predation directed towards them. So uh, kind of following the uh, IPHC, the halibut approach, we took these 16 different models and created uh, three or actually four different model ensembles uh, uh, following their approach, having an ensemble for where we combined all the single species models, combined all the multi-species models with no halibut, the multi-species models with halibut, and the multi-species models with halibut that was uh, the relative numbers at age from the their survey. Um, and from these ensembles, we can output time series of uh, the biomass consumed as prey. And so um, similar to the time series of biomass with Pollock, Aerotooth, Flounder, and Cod, we see that generally somewhere between uh, half a million to 1.5 million metric tons of Pollock is consumed by predators in our model each year. And we can decompose that into uh, predation from each predator, where on the right side, we see uh, uh, the time series of biomass consumed by each predator uh, with the line type referring, or referring to the uh, uh, different predator. Um, and here we see Mostly arrow two flounder is, is the main predator of Pollock in the, in the upper right panel. And this is kind of an ugly table, but uh, the main thing I wanted to get out of this is that uh, when we compared these models using AIC, we found that the multi-species model um, without uh, halibut in it uh, provided the best fit to the data, and uh, which was uh, kind of a cool result. And also from these, we can um, output time series of, of uh, total natural mortality. So on the left-hand side, we have total natural mortality from the single species model of Pollock. Um, and on the right side, we have the total natural mortality of, of uh, Pollock from the multi-species model without hal halibut, or yeah, without halibut, and we can uh, output this and uh, to either uh, inform kind of uh, ecosystem status reports or or use them for assessments or um, or what have you. So yeah, that was kind of a uh, quick overview of, of all this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, Seattle modeling I've been doing. and uh, um, But uh, kind of the main thing I wanted to get out of this is we um, have this cool model now and we really tried to, we made an R package out of it. And if anyone's kind of interested in doing something similar because uh, these models tend to take a lot of development time, as, as I've realized personally. And uh, so if anyone wants to do something similar, we uh, 
tried to make it very flexible to use, um, easy to use, and it currently has functionality for projection with different HCRs. You can either use uh, kind of the West Coast PSTAR approach, the just a standard FSPR, FSPR or or the kind of tier approach used in Alaska or 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 um, uh, uh, Australia. And it has different functions for model averaging, uh, MSEs, and simulation testing, and uh, tried to put as much documentation in there as possible so, so others could, could go out and use it. Um, yeah. All right. So that was a little bit about the overview of the, the of the Seattle model and, and uh, the R package we developed. And now I'm gonna kind of go into some preliminary work I've been doing on uh, using the Seattle model to really get at that question of uh, does ignoring uh, predation inhibit our, uh, uh, the performance of current, uh, our current management strategies. So in Alaska, these stocks are managed by uh, um, single species assessments with uh, this kind of sloping harvest control rule. Um, and we wanted to use uh, um, these Seattle models as operating models in a management strategy evaluation to get at um, that question. So this is mostly because previous studies that try to get at the importance of predation on on single species management strategy have been somewhat limited. And, and these studies have really fallen into kind of two classes. Uh, a projection study where, where you take a single species model and project it forward under some misspecified fishing mortality or, um, 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 and this can help you kind of get at the predictive capacity of the model or consequences of, of management actions, um, or uh, um, or there's also been kind of simulation estimation studies where where a multi-species model will simulate data and then you'll fit a single species model to that simulated data and evaluate the bias in model outputs and um, that doesn't really get at kind of Evaluating the performance of, 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 of management because you don't have this kind of iterative feedback between the system and your your management uh, in terms of continued data collection and uh, refinement of that management strategy. So uh, continued estimation and updating of assessment models or or changing those models, and um, in some ways, they don't account for feedback between species. So if you fish one species, what will happen to the other? Um, some of these simulation studies are a little bit limited in that. So essentially, we, uh, what a management strategy is, is we or evaluation is, we take uh, some sort of model that we are going to say this represents the truth, and in our case, this is we're going to use a single and multi-species Seattle model, and these are the operating models. And from year one, we'll simulate survey and fishery data from those operating models, and then take an estimation model, and in the, our case, we're going to use single species uh, assessment models, uh, and fit it to the simulated data. And from that estimation model, uh, estimate uh, target and limit reference points, which will be used in a harvest control rule to output catch. And that catch recommendation will then input back into the operating model uh, in the subsequent year and keep going along with that cycle uh, where the next year we'll simulate some more fishery and survey data, refit the estimation model, plug the uh, target and reference or target and limit reference points and uh, current uh, 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 
biomass estimates into the harvest control rule, output a catch and, and do that uh, for, for a number of years. So in this management strategy evaluation, we, um, uh, the, we're going to use the Seattle models for the Gulf of Alaska and Eastern Bering Sea. Um, and the models end in uh, 2018 and 2017. And so we're going to use a kind of simulation that's until 2060, representing uh, more than twice the maximum age of, of the longest lived species in, in, the, um, um, in each of these models. And uh, kind of as the start point of this experiment, we're going to project the models under uh, constant recruitment. So we're going to randomly sample historic recruitment deviates, but assuming that mean recruitment is going to be constant through time. Uh, and for our operating models, we're going to have uh, a single species model. And in this case, we're uh, looking at uh, age uh, vary, varying m, but time invariant m. Uh, and we also have a model where uh, we have age invariant m and time invariant m that's estimated, but uh, I won't go too much into that. And, and then we have our multi-species model, which I, which I talked about before. And for our uh, management strategies, uh, we have two estimation models. We have this single species model where we fix uh, natural mortality at a uh, kind of time invariant, but age variant mortality. And, and these are the values that are either currently used for the uh, uh, assessments in Alaska or, uh, or in the Seattle models in, or single species Seattle models. Uh, or we'll estimate a uh, age invariant uh, natural mortality. And for our harvest control rule, we'll use the, uh, the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council's tier three harvest control rule, which is a SBR based control rule. And I uh, uh, won't be going too much into that, but would be happy to provide more information later on. So just to kind of walk you through a little bit of, of the different models we have. On the left-hand panel, we have the Gulf of Alaska, Seattle models. Um, and on the right hand, we have the Eastern Bering Sea, Seattle models with the um, multi-species model in purple and the um, single species models in yellow and green. And one of the things I want you to take away is that generally for the, um, uh, in the Eastern Bering Sea, we estimate um, um, natural mortality for Pollock to be greater than the fixed values we used. And so that'll come be important, important down the line. While in the Gulf of Alaska, we estimate natural mortality be, to be less than the, the fixed value. And so the uh, single species model where we estimate natural mortality is, uh, estimates a lower biomass level than, than the fixed value and also the multi-species model. And um, yeah. And for this, uh, management strategy evaluation, we're interested in a few performance metrics. One is the fishery performance, and this is average catch and interannual catch variation. The conservation performance, where we're looking at how's the terminal spawning stock biomass relative to the target spawning stock biomass. Um, in this case, this is uh, uh, kind of 40% SB0. Uh, the probability of being overfished and the probability of overfishing. Um, and 
I'm going to look at this either through the perspective of our uh, estimation model, how do we perceive if we're overfishing or uh, overfished, and the operating model, are we truly overfishing and overfished? Um, and one of the problems with this is that uh, within the multi-species context, we don't kind of have a straight standard definition of what is overfishing and what is overfished. And so we uh, selected um, kind of 25% SB0 as overfished in the uh, multi-species context where SB0 is, is set by projecting the model forward uh, under no fishing and no recruitment uh, deviations. And the uh, overfishing is the F that gets you to that 25% SP0. And, and uh, we were lucky enough that that was estimable. So here's two uh, outputs of depletion from 200 simulate MSE simulations, where the operating model was the single species model with a fixed age varying M. And the estimation model was the single species model with a fixed age varying M. And this is essentially a self test. And um, the uh, black line is the uh, operating model um, uh, projected under no fishing. And the blue lines are the uh, oper operating model or the quantiles for the operating model post the MSE process. And the blue, or this blue horizontal line is our target, which is in this case 40%, and the red line is our limit, which is 20% uh, SP0. And uh, as you can see, we're dancing right around that blue 40% line. So our self-test kind of checks the box and we're, we're getting where we want to go, which is great. And looking at some of the performance metrics, when we compare the uh, different estimation models and different operating models, the uh, at least for catch, the big thing was whether or not we estimated M and what that value of M was for uh, for our performance metrics of catch, where. If we perceived the, if we estimated the stock to be more productive, we got more catch. If we estimated the stock to be less productive, so a smaller M, we got less catch. Um, in us, on a similar note, uh, if we estimated M to be to be uh, greater than our fixed value, uh, um, uh, we got more catch variability. While for COD, if we uh, estimate M to be less than the fixed value, we got less catch variability. And ultimately, when we look at the catch time series, this comes out to, they look very similar, but the scaling is the, the big difference. And for uh, looking at the operating model and terms of the terminal spawning stock biomass over the target spawning stock biomass, um, we see that uh, for the single species operating models, when we match the model, we are right around 0.4, which is where we want to be. Um, while when we estimate M, and so misspecify natural mortality, we, we at least for Pollock, we're, we're lower than 0.4 because we estimate M to be larger than the fixed value, while for COD we're above 0.4 because we estimate M to be less, and so we're catching less than our operating model says we can. Um, while for the multi-species models, uh, it's kind of fun. We get our N depletion to be greater than one uh, for Pollock when we fix mortality um, and uh, kind of around or slightly above 0.4 for arrowtooth and cod for, for both the Bering Sea and Gulf Alaska because there's less predation. 
Um, and in terms of our probability of being overfished, uh, uh, we generally do a good job um, across um, uh, estimation models and operating models. Um, uh, apart from, uh, we have about a 10% probability of being overfished if we estimate M when the true operating model fixes M. And uh, this is because we uh, uh, fish harder than uh, 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 we would ideally like because uh, we perceive the stock to be more productive than it actually is. And here's some more of those uh, depletion time series where uh, this is for the Gulf of Alaska, where our operating model is the single species model, and we have the two estimation models. And um, again, the self-test on the left looks good. And on the right, what I want to note is that uh, Pollock on the upper right, we're tending to, to deplete it more than uh, we would ideally like because we're estimating M to be higher. And for COD, we're at the bottom right, we're um, uh, 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 keeping the biomass kind of high because we're estimating the natural mortality to be lower than it is in the operating model. Perfect. And in the case of our uh, multi species models, where we're our multi species operating models with the two different management strategies um, um, for the fixed uh, mortality, we actually estimate that depletion under fishing is, is greater for Pollock uh, uh, than depletion when there's no fishing because we fish arrowtooth flounder out and uh, have a bit of a predator release for Pollock, which is always kind of a interesting result. So this uh, blue line, this kind of darker blue line is above the black line, which is the model projected under no fishing. Um, but this is not the case when we estimate M where we uh, uh, estimate the stock to be more productive and, and fish a bit harder. Perfect. And in terms of our perception of of if we're overfished. And so this is calculated at the end of each assessment. We, we do a good job. We tend not to think that the stock is overfished, um, or I guess we think we do a good job. We, we tend to think the fish is not overfished, except for cod, um, uh, which I won't go into too much. Um, and uh, when, uh, we look at the time series of our perceived depletion. Uh, um, we tend to hit that 40% mark, so we're, we're, we think we're doing good. Uh, but when the operating model is the multi-species model, when we fix M, we have a really hard time getting to that 40% depletion level because we perceive the stock to be less productive than it is, and it takes some time for us to estimate a uh, mean recruitment uh, that matches the uh, additional productivity of the, the, the multi-species operating model. While when we estimate M, we don't have, have this problem. Um, and again, we don't have a problem. We tend to perceive that we're not overfishing. Uh, um, you know, I'll skip all this for time, but um, kind of overall, uh, estimating M leads to greater catch and, and more variation, but also we can better approximate the mortality trends in the multi-species um, uh, operating model. And generally, all the management strategies achieve their conservation objectives. But while I think it's easy to compare the estimation models, um, I'm kind of going, thinking through how can we compare these operating models? Because that's kind of where the, the question is of, is predation 
inhibiting our management performance. So I still have a little bit more thinking to do about how to uh, think about this a little bit more on, on uh, if we're actually inhibited. Uh, and this leads to some future work that we're going to do where we're uh, exploring some additional harvest control rules, the P-STAR approach, the tier one approach from the Australia, and some dynamic biomass reference points, adding in recruitment trends for arrow to flounder to see if there's a trend if, if our performance uh, goes off, and also later on uh, trying to include some climate and multi-species harvest control rules. And with that, I'll end it and take any questions. Thank you so much, Grant. Um, audience, we have about 10 minutes for your questions. So uh, if you have a question, please uh, type it in the questions chat box and I'll read it to Grant. And as a reminder, uh, Grant has shared his slides with us. So please feel free to download them before we end the webinar uh, from the handouts menu in the control panel. And one more last reminder before we start uh, with the questions. Uh, today's uh, recording will be uploaded to the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel in just a few hours. So if you'd like to share Grant's presentation with a colleague, I encourage you to go there. I'll, I'll put the, the um, link in the chat box in just a moment. So let's see. Uh, we have a first question. Um, Grant, this first question asks, what's the answer to your uh, titular question? And have you tried to put this into the NF toolbox? Um. So what's the answer to my question of is predation inhibiting um, um, or is ignoring predation inhibiting our management performance? Um, I think right now when I assume that there's no uh, recruitment trends, we're, we're doing all right. Uh, I think the, the interesting bit is going to be when I assume that there's uh, some sort of recruitment trend uh, in the species and, and um, and also, I think uh, if we kind of explore some more interesting harvest control rules of say, so currently there's a cap on on ground fish harvest. If we explore different caps or or uh, kind of uh, current also arrowtooth flounder is is uh, not fully fished. If we keep arrowtooth flounder as a as kind of uh, unfished state, what will happen there? And um, I think that's where kind of we're really good at some of the, uh, that question a little bit better, but also still thinking about it um, um, and uh, um, kind of working through these results. And so don't have a clear answer yet. But, uh, and in terms of the NFT toolbox, um, yeah, I've thought about it and yeah, that'd be awesome. I think uh, one of my worries is that I'm still doing a decent amount of active development and so it's not at least on the the, the management strategy evaluation code and also uh, soon to be some of the multi-species har harvest control rules code and so um i would worry that i wouldn't uh uh um uh be able to do as much active development as as i currently am thank you we're going to wait to see if we get some more questions. Um, and I just wanted to add, you you uh, cited a number of really great articles in your in your paper and your presentation. So I encourage people to contact NOAA Central Library or your lab library, and we'd be happy to provide access to those articles. I'm sure we have all of them. Um, next question that came in uh, is a compliment. It, it says, great work, Grant. I wanted to ask about the first part where you compared the single and multi-species versions. Did you find that the NLL improved for all components in all years in the multi-species version? If not, what do the, those patterns look like? Does that translate to noticeably better fits to the data? Yeah, um, while the uh, joint negative log likelihood across data types uh, was better for the multi-species model that didn't include predation, the uh, negative log likelihood of the different likelihood components uh, um, was uh, uh, varied depending on the 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 multi-species model or the multi-species uh, uh, setup, and so I forget what exactly um, it's in my paper, but I, I uh, honestly forget uh, which one did better. But I think when we had the multi-species model. 
I think maybe it was the index data that did better while the single species model, the composition data fit better. Um, and I think there was some sort of general trend there, but I, I, off the top of my head, I forget. No problem. I, I can always, you, the person's name will be attached to uh, information, so you can always get that back to them. Uh, another question asked, nice talk. While the multi-species model had the lowest AIC, there was a single species model within one unit. Did I read that table right? Yeah, yeah, it was, um, um, it, yeah, it was within one unit. Um, uh, yep, but it was not the absolute lowest. Great. Uh, next question to ask, has this work been communicated to the end Pacific, or the North Pacific Council or International Pacific Halibut Commission? Do you anticipate any tweaks to the 2 million metric ton total ground fish harvest limit as a result of your findings? Um, yeah, I think the, well, uh, Ian Stewart's a co-author on this paper, and so that's been communicated uh, with the IPHC, and um, I've done a, a few presentations on this to the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, and, and, um, and also some of the uh, results of the Seattle model are now currently used in their, um, uh, there's like a, what is it, the ecosystem status report. I, I, I write a few little, uh, uh, take some out, update the model and output and uh, put that into a little document for the ecosystem status report. Um, so it's definitely being communicated and I would love opportunities to uh, communicate more and kind of get it ingrained if it, if it's useful to them um and then in terms of the the two million metric ton cap um we have currently i can uh uh we have the kind of code base to test that but we're not really um evaluating that right now great right. Uh, some, someone actually added a comment that says uh, those AIC values are not going to be reliable, so it's hard to say what a meaningful difference is. I don't know if you yeah. want to address that. Um, yeah. yeah, that's why when we did the ensemble modeling, we didn't really use AIC. Um, um, we followed the IPHC approach. Uh, another question came in. It says, nice talk, lots of results to think about. What were the largest differences in the parameter estimates for the same species between multi-species and single species approaches? Ooh. Um, ooh. I'd have to go back and look. I mean, the the things we were really looking at were were not the parameters itself, but the derived quantities and the big differences came out in terms of the biomass estimates. Um, and I think that's one of the problems with these sorts of models is that there is so much going on uh, that kind of uh, uh, picking out the appropriate diagnostics and uh, and uh, making them interpretable is is a is a challenge. Excellent. Well, um, you know, give it a second to see if we get another question. But if not, thank you for, to the audience for providing so many great questions. And uh, again, I will be sending all of these to Grant. Um, if there's any further information that needs to be added, he can get, he can get back to you. But it looks like that was the last question. So uh, thanks again, Grant, for your presentation, for, for you know, kind of providing, uh, giving your time to to library seminars today. Um, and Kristen, thank you for, again, for, as always, for organizing the National Stock Assessment Science Seminar. I hope you will join us again, audience, uh, for NOAA Central Library's National Stock Assessment Science Seminar series, which we host every uh, month, the third, I'm sorry, the first Thursday of the month at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, happy Cinco de Mayo. And uh, thank you again, Grant. Take care. Yeah, thanks.